Have you ever wondered how long you could survive on your own in the wilderness? How long you could last if you were alone by yourself? No electricity, no friends, no phone out in the middle of nowhere? My first guest asked those questions of herself. Hey, I'm Zach. Welcome to the Ranger Cabin. Today I have a fireside chat with a new friend of mine, Megan Hanacek. Megan was a finalist on the hit History Channel series, Alone, on season three. Her story and experience on Alone really speaks to, in a physical, linear, kind of tangible kind of way, many of the topics that I want to explore and go deep on with this series. With your support, connecting, liking, sharing, subscribing, telling your friends, listening with your friends, commenting on social, at The Ranger Cabin, we can keep the fire hot with ideas and conversation with interesting people that I've connected to from all over the world. And it's a real pleasure to have you here. I'm really excited to dig into this. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in the future. So just to provide a bit of context before we get started, I think it's really important because this interview starts off kind of slow and then we get really into the weeds. It's a, it, it's pretty exciting. So just to frame things up a bit here about the experience we'll be chatting about. What I find interesting about this series alone is that season one launched near my home on Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. And the premise of the show is pretty cut and dry. Survive as long as you can by yourself in a harsh environment. People are dropped off by boat individually on a remote beach at the end of summer and they find out how long they can survive with no human contact and only a few select items and tools. They are given camera gear to film themselves and basically create the series and a satellite phone to tap out with when they've had enough. And the idea behind the show is to me really interesting. Uh, It's a nice blend of recklessness, purely it, it just doesn't look safe a lot of the time and raw reality i mean big repercussions if you are injured out there by yourself um it's entertaining especially the hours leading up to when people decide to tap out they quit for all kinds of reasons Um, they play head games with themselves and people just go some go crazy and some hold it together it's it's quite fascinating Most of the areas where the first season happened were in places I had spent time as a kid, camping, fishing, prawning, goofing around with my family and friends. And when I was old enough, when I was about 12, my little brother and I would take my dad's aluminum boat into the little bays and the beaches, looking for treasures and watching wildlife and uh, just doing kid stuff. And we had fishing rods, of course. And we, what we discovered is if you could get a line in the water, even if it was only 10 feet offshore, the odds were pretty good you could catch something, even if, even if you were terrible at fishing. There were times we caught little rock cods without even letting the line spool off the reel. It was just ridiculous abundance if you had a boat, even a small one. But... The big factor is the water and the air there is bone chilling cold in the fall in the winter months and the landscape and the Pacific Ocean demand a lot of respect. A hot fire is critical to any kind of enjoyment at the end of the day and the heavy rains make it really hard to stay dry and start fires. The thick bush along the seashore, the slippery rocks, bears everywhere and the highest density of cougars in the world make getting around extra exciting. (laughs) Eating salmon, crabs, prawns all day before you get into the tent smelling like a fish uh, definitely elevate your senses at nighttime. It's one of the most beautiful and haunting places in the world. It's mystic 
and powerful and spiritual because it's abundant and harsh. This is where Megan grew up and lives with her family today. And after that second season of the show, I heard about Megan for the first time. Her story kind of hit this mythical status through my conversations with people. Comments like, you know, if Megan got on that show, she'd be there for a decade before tapping out. I had to meet her. And wouldn't you know it, she got her shot and I got my shot. (laughs) So thanks again for being here. Throw another log on the fire and sit back and enjoy episode one of the Ranger Cabin, Megan's Journey. Light the fire. Alone is the series that uh, it plays on the History Channel, I believe, as kind of a That's in correct. syndication. Yeah, it's one of their biggest shows, actually. Did you just apply like everybody else would apply? Quite a few people had sent me the application, and I kind of foo-fooed it and thought, this is ridiculous. Like, we don't even have cable TV, so I don't even watch TV. And that was the last thing for my mind, to be on TV, let alone a reality TV show. Like, I never in my wildest dreams had thought I'd be on TV, let alone on a major network. So I did. Eventually, one day, it had been forwarded to me probably six times over two different seasons. And I had applied. And my husband and I both decided, okay, let's just see what happens next. We'll just see. Like, we'll just see if this is something I seriously want to consider doing. And next thing I knew was uh, I got my videos into them within two days. I had to quickly pull together some video footage and answer some questions. And uh, three weeks later, I was flying to New York to do a a boot camp. Okay, so tell me about this boot camp. (laughs) Tell me what you can tell me. Yeah, well, the boot camp is a week of assessment. So they are not only looking at your skills in the field, you spend two nights and three days in the field building uh, survival shelters, foraging, uh, trying to get friction fires going from, that's wood on wood friction fires. So no lighters, uh, no flints even, uh, just trying to get a fire started just with wood. Um, also, uh, we had to kill rabbits, you had to grab a rabbit out of the box and break its back and then gut it and eat it. <laughs> and it was some of the, some of the potential contestants had a hard time with that. It was just kind of sprung on us, grab this cute bunny from the box and, and harvest it and see what you can do with it. Um, and then not only the skills in the field, but we also had psychological tasks. We had MRIs done. We had um, in, we had intelligence tests done to us. So it was full on week of assessment. Wow. So <laughs> was there any teaching going on, or was it more of a like, show us what you got? Yeah, it wasn't teaching. We had to show them what we had, and uh, I completed the week. And I actually, you know, there there was definitely more male potential candidates there than female. It's Uh, more of a male dominated field. But I I left New York and I came back to my husband and said, (laughs) there is no way that I'm getting picked for this show because some of the traps, for example, Greg Govins from British Columbia had amazing traps. Like they were engineering marvels where you were to drop a marble down from the top of the tree and it would spring seven different traps and catch an animal at the end. Right. So when you're doing your show prep after seeing that, I mean, so did yeah. the approval come? Like, did you get it fairly soon after? Well, in New York, we all went to New York assuming that season three was going to be on Vancouver Island again. And we got a contract and we were told to open it all at the same time. And we all started reading through and it said Patagonia. And we were like, what? <laughs> we're pa- Patagonia? This is crazy. Like exciting, but crazy. Because where we went in Patagonia was very, very remote. It was at the Chilean and Argentinian border. Um, so we, uh, what was the question? Well, just like if the approval came. So okay. like how long was that? Yeah. So when we were in New York, uh, we found out that, you know, the season three was going to be in a different area of the world. And uh, we returned back to our hometowns uh, spread throughout North America And we found out, those of us that were chosen found out within five days that we had the potential if we chose to accept it. So 
So your hometown right now is basically where season one and two were hosted. And season four. And season four as well. Yeah. So, you know, holy smokes. So was there, you know, obviously you feel like a survivor and very comfortable on the North Island. Yes. Where you are right yes. now. So when, you know, when you found out Patagonia, did you even know where Patagonia was? I had traveled through Patagonia on my way to uh, Antarctica before. I worked in Antarctica. I worked in Antarctica before, um, but Patagonia is a huge area of South America. So, um, you know, it really could have been anywhere. It could have been down by the ocean. It could have been high elevation, which we were high elevation, um, which in itself presents a lot of challenges being away from the ocean. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, what was your plan? I guess you had a short time to prepare and just learn as much as you could. Yeah. So uh, let me go back to season one, two and four. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, season one, two and four were in my hometown area, which was very interesting because when I chose to go to Patagonia, you had to sign a contract, a confidentiality contract and not tell anyone. So when I actually went, uh, only my husband and my mother-in-law, father-in-law and father knew where I went. Even my children didn't know. Um, because there were potential monetary impacts from having it get out where what you were doing and that you were actually going to be a contestant on this show. Interesting. Um, so, so you just have to disappear. Yeah, which, you know, we always, we kind of laugh now, but it would have been funny to do a split screen of my husband back home and me in the woods and to see which one was more chaotic because my husband had so many people, even people that we didn't really know confront him in the grocery store and ask where, like, where's your wife? Because it's very unusual for me to go away for a long period of time, being a mother and a wife and and you're so in a small town. In a small town where I've been for over 30 years. Everybody knows everybody's business. Exactly. And people have good intentions, but you know, once you're gone after a couple of months, people do actually really get worried. And Doesn't that feel good? I had some of my girlfriends missed. at my past workplace um, get called into the manager's office to say like, how well do you know Megan's husband? Like, honestly, like what happened to her? <laughs> And they actually showed up at our house when I was gone and uh, out of concern asked my husband, like, where is your wife? Like, seriously, where is she? And my husband would say, well, she's in this, um, she's, she's in the CIA. <laughs> and they were just. Oh, OK. Yeah. So he was pretty confidential. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting situation to have been from the area where they filmed season one, two and four. Um. And up until the point when I did the season, it was season one and two. But I'll, that was the biggest news around that area for a couple of years, is that this big TV show had been filmed up there. And then all of a sudden, I disappeared. Yes. Yeah. So some people made the linkage, um, but some other people thought well, I Well, that's just, where the lore comes from. Yeah, I guess I'm so. sure of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Megan was talking smack and then got shipped off. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually did talk a little bit of smack about season one and- you know, that may have been why they picked me, too, for that drama to see, you know, <laughs> if I didn't make it past a couple of days, it could come back and bite me in the butt. It would have been really interesting for your ego. If I will tell you this. When I did get an interview, like in New York, they one of the final uh, events that happened is that you get interviewed by some of the executive at History Channel. And one of them includes a past Amazing Race winner. And they kind of laughed when I walked in the room as I sat down and said, I bet you wish this, this season three was going to be in your area. And I said, actually, you know what? I, it's a bit of a relief because if I didn't win it, I would never live that down for the rest of my life. At least I can go somewhere else and have that pressure off of me a bit. Totally. Yeah. And for me to, you know, to be just, you know, maybe 50 kilometers away from my home, and want to go home, um, it's nice to just completely remove myself away from all those pressures and, and drivers and just focus in on the task at hand. So I love that. So when you're pre, um, you know, just having that physical distance and, you know, being so rooted in that 
in that territory and socially and physically um, and with your work as well. I mean, there's a lot of mm, preconceptions that you would do really well for yourself and you would put that pressure on yourself as well. Yeah. Undoubtedly. Um, but what, what does a convert, like, was there time to actually contemplate? Yes, I'm going. Or, you know, what does a conversation look like with your husband? And obviously your children didn't know. So you were probably, you know, I'm going to work somewhere or. What does that look like? Because that is like such a massive step in a relationship on so many fronts, right? It is. And I think, uh, I think it's a testament um, to my husband and his support and us still being together that he was willing to full heartedly support me, not knowing when I was going to be back. Uh, it's easy to look back in retrospect and think about how you could plan for something like this, but there was a real rawness to this event. And, um, you know, there's only so much you can prep. You don't, we didn't even really know where in Patagonia where we were going. Um, we, about five days before we flew out, we knew what city we were flying into, but we didn't even know what elevation we were going to go at. So you can prep as much as you can in terms of gear. Um, but I think that that's a really big unknown is how it's going to impact your relationships when you're gone. And also when you get back and you don't have any video footage or photos, you have nothing to really share with your family other than articulating the experience. And we'll get, we'll definitely get to that at, yeah. you know, at later on here. And I'm just wondering, like, did you have a conversation with yourself? Like, what are my motives? Like was, you know, the prize yeah. money is what, 500,000 or 250 or? The prize money is uh, $500,000 American. So obviously that's a factor. Yeah. Was like, it the whole factor? No, definitely not. Okay. And, um, you know, even season one, when they first put the show premise together, there was no prize until a couple of days before they launched, they decided to offer a monetary prize. And I think the show in itself is symbolic of so many things in life. Like you can't negate the fact that money, even though it's only currency has only really been around for 2,500 years in our society. Um, you can't negate the fact that money does open up other opportunities if you do possess it. So, you know, that gives you something to continually strive towards is having that potential of other opportunities at the end. But I think if you go into the show with that as your only driver, you're not going to go very far. And we saw so many examples of that. Yes. Right. Yes. And I, you, there's so much to the show, like even myself going, there's so much to the show, even at the end, having watched all of our season three episodes, it gives you new insight into how people approach the journey through different ways. We're all basically, we were all basically in the same area of Patagonia. There was little subtle differences in the territories that we were at, but it really gave you insight into you uh, as an individual human being and how you approach things. I learned a lot about myself. The first couple of days I was there, uh, they didn't show this on TV, but I actually built a fully functioning fishing rod with a reel and I had used uh, hooks as eyelets and I was casting, but I quickly realized that I was overcomplicating. Um, I was overcomplicating that one task. I had to really focus in on my other tasks, like shelter building, foraging other things. And I had to think of a new way to approach that challenge. Right. Yeah. So, so, so was there something you wanted to prove to yourself in doing this? Obviously there was, but what, like, what did that look like? Did you have a, a mantra or did you have come up with, I need to do this because, or were you trying to prove something to somebody or all of the above? I don't know. Yeah. I'm not the type of person that tries to prove, uh, myself 
uh, to the external world, but it was more my own internal growth. And that's why I'm really so appreciative that I had a partner that was willing to support that because in a lot of ways it is really selfish to extract yourself. Like it's a self focused event for a long time. And I had a partner that was willing to allow me to go do that and extract myself being a mother and a wife and a coworker in the household. I took time off work to do it. And uh, the lessons I learned from that are almost immeasurable. And you have two kids and how old were they at the time? Uh, I have two children. So I have a daughter and I have a son. And at the time my daughter was nine and my son turned six when I was out there on the show, which was very difficult for me. Yes. Yes. To be away during that time at his birthday. So what, were there any, um, were there any kind of preps that you did? So you found Patagonia, you're on your way, you got your ticket. Did you have any books or snare, like snare guides or you had to choose 10 items to take with you. So there must've been some kind of conversation around that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, it's interesting because we, uh, we were allowed to finalize our 10 items. Uh, when we were down in Patagonia, we picked our 10 items and brought them with us, but we were also allowed to bring a couple extra things that we wanted as potentials that we could swap out. And, uh, but where we were in Patagonia was quite a bit in lower elevation. There was rabbits and hares running everywhere. (laughs) So when we were there, we were there probably for six days ahead of actually getting launched up into the mountains. And quite a few of us, like some of us even contemplated just not bringing a ferro rod and to do friction fires. We tried some of the woods around that area. Um, and we looked around at the hares and rabbits and thought, holy smokes, we're going to like be eating rabbit every night for dinner. (laughs) And I actually did snare a rabbit twice, uh, in my territory, but they are very hard to catch. Like I, the one hare rabbit that I caught, it kicked itself out of the trap and left half of its fur behind. Like they're just very feisty and strong. Um, but there was quite a bit of thought on the 10 items, but it's very, even at that, you don't know exactly where you're being brought. You don't know what your territory is going to look like. So it's a bit of a guesstimate based on your own skill set and what you're willing to adapt with. So, you know, I brought things like a bivo, uh, bivy sack, a bivouac, um, and that might seem something like a comfort item, but in a lot of ways I was thinking that I could use that as a sail for a raft. I had started building a raft as well, but the wood was heavy iron wood, as we found out through Greg Evans, whose raft sank. Um, but there was other things that Gore-Tex material was a lot of it. And I thought I could do a lot of things with it too. And I ended up using it for other things as well, like carrying all the rose hips I collected. And, um, yeah, so there's, you know, it's still a guesstimate no one's ever going to perfect the 10 items they bring. But I will tell you one thing that's indicative of the 10 items I brought was I only brought one food item. And I knew that if I came out of this challenge, I didn't, it wasn't just about the money. It was actually really testing my skill set and not just relying on two food rations. I really wanted to test my skill set and try to extract food and foraging out of that territory. That's wild. Yeah, it's it is pretty intense. And so you had a you had a knowledge. I mean, you're a professional forester, a professional biologist, registered. I yes, believe, that's correct for yeah. both. And and I'm wondering, did you have any South American plant training? You know, it's interesting because one of our nemesis is you know in the Pacific Northwest is Salal. Yeah. All foresters can relate to that oh, when yeah. it's raining and it's eight feet tall and you're it's like jail bars trying to walk through it on a slope. And that's the golf Galtheria genus. And the plant that they showed me picking the berries off down in South America was also a Galtheria plant. So I did recognize that they look quite different, but they're the same genus. I did know that plant. Um, but they have false beaches. We have none of those species. Um, they have monkey puzzle trees. None of us had that in our territory, even though a lot of us wish we had. Um, but they're, you know, even that... If you don't actually have the hands-on experience of working or living in an area, it doesn't, it's not the same as reading it from a book. So I did try to read quite a bit. I had three weeks to prep from being picked, the phone call saying I was going to Patagonia. Um, And I worked all those three weeks up until the day I left. I was in Vancouver working. 
Um, and also trying to arrange uh, childcare, which, you know, I never did, but it was over the summertime. I had never had to do that before in terms of r- arranging a nanny throughout the summer um, and just tying up loose ends at home, like my banking. And it was a really intense three weeks. And in addition to trying to get all my gear. And if you look at my gear that I brought, it was pretty subpar. Like I had a negative 12 Celsius sleeping bag. And many of the nights were negative 20 Celsius. It was freezing. I would curl up in a fetal position in my sleeping bag and finally warm up by about five in the morning. (laughs) And uh, my ferro rod was tiny. I had like an inch and a half ferro rod. And some of the other contestants had a ferro rod that was a foot long. And they've since tightened up, I think, on some of those items. There's not such a disparity in amongst the items, but... Um, it was a really intense three weeks and also just trying to get your mindset into like, wow, this is real, like this is going to happen and still not really, con- not really knowing exactly what you're getting into and also trying to put your fears at ease that you're going into territory with pumas and wild boars and, and just unknown territory that you've never been to before. That's kind of what I wanted to get into next actually is, um, and just so listeners know, I uh, will put uh, in the show notes, I'll put all of the items that you took. There's a video of you presenting your items. So I'll attach that link down below. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the wildlife. So on the North Island, there's, you know, cougars and bears are pretty normal. Um, bears more than cougars, I, I would say. Uh, have you had experience with cats before? Uh, I have. Yeah. Actually, my first cougar I saw was about, I was probably about 12 years old and I was putting the garbage out at our house around 1030 at night. And I saw something coming down the slope across from our house and I looked up and I was a young kid and I thought, oh, that's weird for a dog to be out at this time, but I couldn't see what it was. And then I thought, oh, it's bigger. I can see the bushes moving. And I thought, okay, maybe it's a bear and a black bear. And on Vancouver Island, they're usually not too aggressive unless they have cubs. Um, but then a cougar came out across the road for me, probably about just the the width of the road. And <laughs> I knew I wasn't supposed to do this. I grew up, my dad was a biologist, but you just get caught in the moment. And that was my first cougar I had seen face to face. And I turned down the driveway and booted it to our front door and ran. And uh, luckily, everything you're not supposed to do. Yeah, everything you're not supposed to do. And I just ran in the house and yelled, cougar, cougar, cougar. I was in shock. And we looked out the window and it went into our neighbor's yard and kind of, you know, stealthily took off. But um, not so much for the other family. But luckily for me, it had attacked another animal up the road, I guess. And so it had been filled. It was full of food and it wasn't too interested in attacking a human. But you know, things could just that one instant, things could be very different for me because I do have friends, childhood friends I grew up with that have been chased by cougars. And one of them actually had his feet mauled. He climbed up a tree and he was in grade two and had his feet attacked by the cougar. It is like intensely humbling seeing a cougar in the wild. Yeah. And I know that, um, how should people deal with cougars now if they come across one? Yeah, well, definitely don't turn your back and run and look like prey. <laughs> you want to do everything else and look like prey. So you want to, you know, if you have a walking stick, it's always a good idea to carry a walking stick or something that'll make you look bigger. And if you have children or anyone smaller with you, you want to grab them and get them up higher. You just want to look and slowly back away. You don't want to look like prey to a cat. So, yeah. you know, no sudden movements, uh, yelling, like is a good way to get away and just to slowly kind of an get, attack stance even. Yeah. Uh, like just look, make yourself look a lot bigger to the yeah. cat. Yeah. So this, you know, wildlife on the, on alone has always been a kind of a, a really interesting component mentally for contestants because, you know, in season one, as I recall, there was like two, three people that were down in flames because of bears. And in season three in Patagonia, there was pumas. Yeah. And so did you have an interaction with a puma there? Um, I did see Prince the first couple of nights I was there in the mud after I, I sort of scoped up my territory that first night I got there. And the second night or the second day I was there after the first night, there was definitely cat prints in the mud around the area I was. 
Um, but I wasn't actually worried so much about the puma because if you look, being a biologist, you look at distribution and attacks and there actually hasn't been an attack on a human for over a hundred years down there. Um, so they do have a lot of prey items that they can, other prey that they can chase, but it was the wild boar that got me the wild boar. And we were going into a winter season and the males are very territorial. I don't know if you've ever seen boars, videos. Boars are crazy. Yeah. And right? if you look at people that actually hunt boars, they use guns and dogs. And there's a reason why uh, wild boar are the only mammal that will almost 100% of the time turn around and, and charge you if they get wounded or chased. They are the one mammal that will not retreat. They will come after you. And they, in the winter, they their breastplate is a lot stronger. It's very hard to take down a wild boar if you don't have a gun and dogs. And you knew you knew this going in? Um, yeah, in the three weeks I had to prep, I started reading and looking at these videos and thinking, what did I get myself into? And then just by chance in my territory, I ended up having wild boar the first couple of nights where I'd be dead asleep and get woken up at two in the morning from a herd of them coming down the hill, flipping rocks, like we're dead asleep and you can hear them coming down the hill, flipping rocks, looking for food. So how big are these animals? Well, the biggest ones on earth. So they're, they're invasive. They were transplanted over from Asia and Europe. And some of the bigger males can be over 700 pounds and they have the tusks. So they will, they will, they will try to stab you with their tusks. Weird. And they bite? Uh, it, well, they're, you know, they're like another boar pig. They will, they will eat like they're omnivores, but it's more the tusks getting stabbed with right your calf and having, you know, a major injury that you don't want to deal with. So in the first couple of days you're down there. Yeah. So did you, um, take any, uh, <clears throat> countermeasures? So one of my 10 items, uh, in retrospect, uh, was probably my u- most useless item was the ax. I had a faller's ax and you know, at the time it seemed like a good item. All of us took axes except for Kelly. So nine contestants took axes, if I recall correctly. And the night before we launched, after we had all put our gear away, we were told by the producers, you can't cut anything over five inches. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> So all of us were like, and I had a falling axe and I was like, oh my gosh, like that axe, the head on that axe is five, almost five pounds. So it's heavy. Like if you're, if you know, energy deprived, like the last thing you want to be doing is swinging a piece of steel like that. Um, but I, you know, one thing I did work in my favor was when I did have boar around, it gave me some sense of security that I had, I had some type of protection. So I always at night had that axe unsheathed. So you didn't carve spears and like surround your camp in spears? <laughs> I did fence my, they didn't really show a lot of my shelter. Um, they kind of downplayed it, which is fine. But I did fence the whole area around it. <laughs> Not so much to keep the boars out, but just to give me that extra couple of seconds if something was trying to get in that I could hear um, part of the fence falling down and it would give me a couple extra seconds to get ready. Right. Yeah. So in that preparation, did you feel, um, what was your first priority when you arrived at camp? What, what was the first thing you needed to do to get yourself in a place that you felt, okay, I can do this. Yeah. And the, the biggest item people ask me, what is the most useful thing you have? And I really believe it's that sense of, uh, your inner strength and sense of, uh, calmness. And the first thing I go, I did when I got there was just look around and try to get some sense of familiarity to put me at comfort. Because if you get dropped in, into a situation where you don't recognize anything that can be useful to you, it's very easy to have your body react in a negative way, in a stressful way, and and to really start getting stressed out and making uh, decisions that aren't great decisions for the long term. So the first thing I did was start looking around um, at things that I recognize in terms of plants and trees. And that gave me a sense of calmness right away when I could recognize some of those items. So understanding the landscape. Yeah. And understanding that, Oh, that's a hardwood tree and I can use that for certain things. And I can see that golf area bush over there. That'll be useful. I can eventually harvest off that. There's a flat area at the toe end of that slope. I could potentially build over there. Um, and also just to sort of look around at potentials, but not make a long-term commitment and invest a lot of energy into building a shelter at a site until you've had a chance to get a good look over your territory. Right. I've seen that before on the series where 
guys will build a shelter. They put all this work into it and then it floods. Yeah. And they're just like, oh my God. And it breaks them. Yeah. And so on so many levels that ends up being very detrimental because not only are you having to reinvest energy, re rebuilding somewhere else and trying to stay all the elements, but it's also that it's very demoralizing to all of a sudden lose that sense of security and familiarity. And it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once you lose that foundation of security, it's just, it's this constant struggle to try to get some sense of foundation again to build upon. So one, one of the things I really think about and that's pivotal to this podcast is the idea of what you invite into your space and what you bring in and what you choose to exclude. And what's so fascinating about your journey and your experience here in particular is, you know, you come in with very few items and then it becomes a conversation with yourself in how you manage that one little glimmer of hope, like that I can do this. And these tasks that you're doing, like building a shelter, if that failed, yeah. that could erase that that little piece of hope you yeah. know so what what are the like were you cognizant of that or were you aware of that that protecting that you know self-talk like what were some things that you did to protect yourself yeah. from losing that yeah hope? so the experience itself is always especially at the very front end of the experience it's about multitasking and you're dropped into a situation, and I may have approached the journey itself differently if I'd been dropped into a snowstorm. I may have, you know, right away tried to get into a snow cave or something. But where I got dropped right away, I tried to look at what are my limitations in the short term and long term. So right away, I wanted to look at food source. How am I going to, well, excuse me. So right away, what I looked at was trying to get a secure water source because we had a lake. And one thing I recognized right off the bat is there's a uh, carnivorous plant species along the lake shore, which is very, it's one of the most advanced plant species in the world. It's called the bladder wort and it has little hairs along that stem and they eat different protozoans in the water. So just seeing that right off the bat, I knew I couldn't just drink the water right out of the lake, which you probably shouldn't do anyways, if you're in unknown territory, but right off the bat, that was a hundred percent given that I'm going to end up with a parasite if I drink directly from the lake. And I had no other rivers or creeks in my area, so I always had to boil my water. So right off the bat, water was a really big one to stay hydrated, um, to have some temporary shelter so I have a little bit of security, and also, like I mentioned, to keep some animals at bay for the first couple of nights, um, and then to start looking for food sources. So it's a constant balance, and... It's really determined by what the elements are when you first get dropped into an area that you have to assess basically what are my top five priorities at this moment. And they could be quite different based on different weather, topography. If you're dropped facing a bear right off the beach, it's quite a bit different. And then how do you bring yourself back to that sense of calm and focus for long term? Right. So that, yeah, again, it's kind of like, how do you, how do you, go out, challenge yourself and then come back and recollect yourself yeah. and, and then go out again and, you know, feel like you're going in the right direction yeah. because often you're not right. Like, I don't well, know if and, and if you were to look at this sort of in a graphical format, all of us, the way the show is set up is it's leading into a winter season. That's what the, the first four shows have shown anyways. And so all of us are, progressively declining in weight and health and losing equipment like fishing hooks, it's not getting better. <laughs> you know, you might have your up days and you always have to keep that glimmer of hope that you will find, you know, a stash of like forage material or you may find better tinder or um, if you're lucky enough, maybe you could trap a wild boar or, you know, get a, I was lucky near the end because I had saved some roe that I dried out for months and I, I managed to get six fish in one night, which looking back at the show after I got to see it, I didn't realize that basically the fishing had stopped for everyone. But it was that sort of foresight to keep this for when the times get really rough that at least I have another tool in my toolbox that I can pull out when there's basically uh, very little out there in terms of food source. Yeah, yeah. and trying to catch... 
like and then the, the wildlife so we'll get back to the, we'll get back to that because i think that's the theme really running through the whole piece here is you know that that urge to keep going or that you know protecting yeah. that little egg yeah that is your you know i can do this yeah um you know the wildlife you you had talked about the fox and you know there is this like <laughs> it's funny it's like he, I think we were talking about this earlier where, you know, you have to film all of this yourself, yeah. which is an absurd amount of work and it's such a difficult task. Yeah, it is. And you being a filmmaker can appreciate that how much work gets put into setting up not only one camera angle and switching out batteries and memory cards and remembering to have, you know, to look at the certain angle of the camera, but to set up multiple camera angles so that so that they have a lot to edit from from different shots yeah, if you do catch coverage. a fish yeah. or you see wildlife um yeah so it's it's you know a lot of calories are expended doing that and i spent it didn't always make the show but i spent many shots where i'd set up a camera go way down a beach and then walk back get the camera set it up at my other location and uh, I also climbed the mountain in my territory. I really wish they'd shown that on the show. Maybe it'll end up in footage one day. But I climbed up to the very top of the mountain and I could see all of the lake that I was on, which was interesting. It was, I burnt a lot of calories doing that. But I knew for me that it was an experience that I really wanted to look at the whole area that I was living in. And that's what you said your number one was, yeah. was just understanding the land that you're on. Yeah, and really getting that sense that I can sustainably integrate into this area and not um, really impact it in a detrimental way. And when I picked and foraged, I always left um, quite a bit of the plant material behind, like the mushrooms I picked uh, like in a harvestable manner so they would grow back. And, um, you know, I one thing I did, I had 200 traps set up terrestrially and one thing that 200? I, 200, I know, and they didn't show that. That's been, a, that was a lot of energy, but oh one cool trap that I set, set up that took me over a week to set up was, uh, I ended up cutting up once I realized my fishing net was kind of pointless. I made it into three different items. And one of the items was a net trap that I set up over the bow of a tree that lay on the ground and was triggered. And I actually had the fox go through it and jump out of the trap but one thing that got caught on my game trail camera was uh, there was a margay cat, which is also known as a gaddle cat, which is very, very cool as a biologist to see on a game trail camera because it's an endangered cat. It's about the size between a cougar and a house cat, beautiful markings on it. And I didn't actually get to see it face to face, but I saw it on my game trail camera and I had to rejig all of those 200 traps so I didn't catch the endangered animal. But, you know, for me, like winning the show and having caught an endangered animal as a biologist, I just, I, it would have really taken away from the experience for me. Okay. That's, so that is a really interesting component and it may, because that would be a self-talk and that would be a decision that you're making in the field while you're starving. Yes. And all of yes. a sudden you're getting ethical. Yeah. Right. So tell me about that. Like, is that kind of a, it was unforeseen. And I think that unforeseen maybe played into yeah. And, uh, you know, like I just I feel that I know my values and ethics really well. And I've been challenged in those throughout my life. And no amount of money could take that away from me. So I knew I'd have to go back to reality outside of a reality TV show. And I wanted to fully take positive experiences and self-growth from this experience back into my real life and integrate them. I'd say for me, that was my number one goal of doing this is to really have a unique experience. And the show is unlike nothing else. Like it just is such a unique premise of the show to extract yourself from everything else in the world, technology, relationships, um, anything, you know, and to have very limited items to live with is the ultimate journey. It is very, very challenging and you really get to know yourself doing it. Do you find you can recreate that moment for yourself now? Um, I find I approach um, problem solving from a deeper human experience now. And I find that my strategy is 
longer term viewing. I used to strategize on different problems as well and just my approach at life and just my view on time management and how valuable time with loved ones and having um, a really valuable human, uh, a really valuable experience while I'm on this earth because really we're here for a very short time when you look at the history of the earth we're really here for a short time and what are you going to do with that time not hurt endangered animals <laughs> I guess yes that's true but so, I, so is there like is there some measure of I know that and I'm not questioning your ethics because but I but I often wonder if I was put in that same situation if I would be rejigging 200 different traps to prevent me from you know hurting an endangered cat i don't have that knowledge i wouldn't i don't know if i would really care my ignorance would carry me through and go dang i'm gonna have a great (laughs) hat at the end of this but it turns out you happen to know that it's an endangered animal yeah and that shifted everything for you possibly right potentially because i did have a fox that I could have killed and, um, you know, I did set up some traps that were specifically made for the fox and I was getting really frustrated with fox. Like it was in my territory, um, within that first week till well into the sixties of days. And I didn't sleep throughout the nights because of that fox. <laughs> and, but, you know, I really viewed it as, uh, I really wanted to integrate into that land base. I didn't want to just come in there, you know, killing and and foraging and devastation. And, you know, I really wanted to integrate myself first and then maybe think about near the end, did I really want to harvest this fox? And, you know, in the end, it, to me, that the money really was was not the big driver at the end. God, it sounds crazy for people. It sounds is- very crazy for people, but... For me, it's indicative of my own life. Money is not a huge driver. And, you know, if I was starving and uh, my family was, if it had been my family out there and it was a real life situation, it may be quite different. But I, I was lucky enough that I had the opportunity to tap out of that experience. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so things are starting to change for you. I thought you were doing great. You know, spoiler alert, but you made it to the last episode of the show. Yeah. And, and you were looking pretty good, you know, like from, from as far as the camera could see. I was doing okay. And I, you know, one thing that was a big factor for me was I knew I didn't want to come out of that experience with long-term health implications or even like in all honesty, death, it could happen on that show. Like it, you know, there was a backup safety crew, but things can happen. Like there are, there are all I've I've heard of instances where people there's fatalities in these types of situations, not necessarily on the show, but in real life where you go out to the wilderness and accidents happen. So was that decided before you left? Did you have that? Yeah, in your mind? I had that, you know, in my mind, I had I'm going to approach this experience and see as long as I can take it. But these are my own internal rules and they were around my ethics and values about my long term health and um and just really trying to take the challenge as far as I could take, take it within those parameters. So I near then, I, I thought I had one broken molar, but I actually had two sheared off at the back. And they were progressively getting worse in terms of health. And, you know, I didn't know how the other contestants were doing on that last show. But when you look at that, I, I was like, wow, actually, I was actually doing quite well fishing <laughs> you were the there end. i mean the the last i think the last guy left uh 10 or 12 days after you. uh nine days after nine and days and he yeah. had lost uh 73 pounds in 87 days and he was from what i could tell a basket case like they and maybe it's maybe it's fa- like maybe it's false but he was definitely starving yeah and he seemed like he was kind of so internal like he was just rolling into himself. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not talking bad about like good on this guy for staying out there that long. But it becomes like, you know, when you see the the woman, Claire, is that? Uh, Carly. Carly. Was in second. So Carly, you know, I was just like, whoa, like 
so there you go. The, 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 when the starvation, everyone's got a plan until you start starving or yeah. until you get punched in the face. Um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah. like this idea that, you know, you've got these rules for yourself. She, it feels to me like she wouldn't have quit for anything. Well, and I think that's very symbolic of life. Like how far are people willing to uh, compromise their relationships, their time management, um, their values and ethics for external superficial things like money, which, you know, granted it will provide some other opportunities, but really what's the most valuable thing in the human experience? And it really, you know, we all have this, we all are are dictated by time, how much time we have on this earth. And then really the relationships we have with one another in our infinite, within our finite land base on the earth. And so it's a very, very philo- philosophical question. And Everything at that point when you're starving to death, I think becomes pretty philosophical. Yeah, it does. And like, you know, how, you know, is money really, the biggest driver and for some people yes it can be if you really are um lacking in foundation and i i you know the experience really gave me a sense of um appreciation for people that are living with limited opportunities poverty starvation is a big one on the earth it really did give me an appreciation for when you're in that situation the desperation that you have there was often times near the end when I was foraging, there was snow on the ground. I was trying to get greenery. And I often thought about, wow, this is probably how many people in North Korea live, where they're just trying to get any amount of calorie into their body to just to keep living. Yeah, there's like a billion people in the world that don't have access to clean water. You know, they're living by yeah. the lake yeah. with full of parasites. And I, and I think that's like, that is a very humbling, you know, statistic when you were pondering so you've got your ethics you've got your you know you're feeling you're feeling like you have your integrity intact sounds like you're cutting mushrooms the right way and not chopping trees over five inches and um you know you've got your snare rejigged to not capture endangered animals. So I feel like there's this real wrestle with your character and integrity. Is that linked to your tap button? Is obvi- like, is that, was that the major factor or was it that, man, I got these teeth because teeth are nothing to people. You know, yeah. you could, you could rip those out with pliers and away, keep, keep on going, you know, like that in theory. Um, did that ever cross your mind? Yeah, so um, the one thing about the show, too, I knew going in was that I wanted to leave on my terms. I didn't want to be brought out on a stretcher um, with potential long-term health implications that were going to truly affect my real reality back in life outside of the reality TV world. And the show is real. Like, there is no food given to other contestants that I knew of, not given to me anyways. And um, it is truly, we are real people that are on that show. And so there is a real rawness to it. And the tooth um, problem that I had was very real for me because I knew where we were located um, after we drove outside of the uh, town that we'd flown into, that we were really rural and to try to get to a doctor that could deal with this or a dentist was still going to have a time constraint on it. So, you know, for me, I have uh, two children and I didn't want to be stuck in some Patagonian hospital with an infection in my jaw that, you know, could really end up being really detrimental outside of the TV show. Yeah. I mean, anything dental can get into your brain yeah, fairly quickly. fast. Yeah. Yeah. That, Yeah also humbling because i don't know if you'll ever think about you know did you bring a toothbrush we were allowed to toothbrushes but that wasn't (laughs) what caused my tooth problem i actually uh it was actually the one thing i was good at foraging the rose hips i had if anyone who's eaten rose hips or had them in tea the seeds inside are like rocks and i had tried to extract many of the seeds but they occasionally would end up in my fish soups and 
I must have bitten down at some point and then eventually lost part of two teeth. But um, leaving the show really gave me an appreciation for how some of those smaller instances in life are really the bigger things. So 100%. Teeth, yeah, that was like the thing that ended. Spending time with your children, just those little laughs. And I appreciate that now, having my children approach their teenage years, that time really goes quickly. And it's sometimes it's those really small things that, are, that really make life. And um, it also really gave me an appreciation for um, just the how uh you know how close we are to it really gave me an appreciation for uh just being alive and just how the how, how our health is number one and you know anything none of us are immune to having something help into your health you know and not to take it for granted so when that pain started to come in when how what was the final what was the conversation with yourself when you leading up to hitting the button? Well, I had done well a couple of days before that. I had caught a whole bunch of fish, which was a very uplifting moment for me because fish were few and far between for many of us after day 50. And so that was a bit of a bump. And at that point, I made a hammock. I got a boost of energy. And then the weather progressively got worse. Everything seemed to start to get uh, a lot harder quickly. It was very cold at night, negative 20, torrential winds, torrential rain. There was no fish or food really left. I had a bit of food left, but nothing really of substance. Um, All three of us left at that point had lost quite a bit of weight. I think I was doing the best out of the three of us, but I was on the edge of being... Megan, you were badass. Oh, thanks. It was awesome. (laughs) Well, I hadn't lost 73 pounds, man. I would have been the size of like a kindergarten (laughs) child at that point. But, you know, it it comes to a point where I went day 77. I started to look around and think, okay, I've really, really pushed myself. Like, this is a long time. Like, tomorrow I'm going into week 12. And... um, you know, my health is deteriorating. I've been gone for a long time. I have a great life back at home. Uh, my employer had allowed me to take time off. I was supposed to be back to work within to that To work week. with the CIA. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, with the CIA. Um, you know, and my, my child uh, was leaving. One of my children was leaving one school and starting at a new school within a week and a half. And, you know, it just really, all of that started to add up. And I started to think like, you know, I could keep going, but I still, I may not even win this. Like, so it's, it was kind of a breaking point for me. Like the pain of my teeth, um, just and, a whole bunch of things. And then the doubt just starts coming Yeah, in. and you know, I could have kept going, but I knew at that point, like, and like well, having watched the show now, like even if I had gone another nine days and it was down to two of us, like, the person who won, Fowler, had done a great job, but he still had 20 more pounds to lose before he was in the underweight range. And I was right on the brink because I went in just being a normal BMI. And so it was still going to be a long challenge. And Fowler had a mansion of a shelter. He as did. Well. I will. He was amazing at building that shelter. And one thing, I'm not to, trying to be bitter about it, but I didn't have any bamboo in, in my territory. And bamboo would have been amazing. I had one piece of bamboo, which I like to joke with Kelly, that had washed into my shoreline. And I like to joke it was probably like a reject from her chair that she threw onto the lake and it floated yes. over to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but uh, he did an amazing job with his shelter. And Fowler is a very hard worker and very deserving of winning. So you've, you've kind of, hmm, you've talked about takeaways. I mean, if you can sum it up, what... What are things that you do differently now? You've talked about how you reflect on things and and in your actions and in your job and just in your life in general. How do you how do you approach it differently or are there things that you have integrated into your life or gotten rid of? Yeah. Yeah. Um I don't think you can come out of that experience for the amount of time that, you know, five of us went past 70 days. I don't think you can come out of that without a huge appreciation of everything that we have in the developed world. Just everything. The amount of, I approach everything in my life as abundance and opportunity and a huge appreciation for how I spend my time. 
And uh, when we got back, uh, when I returned back to my family, I did huge amount of purging of things that were filling my life, but really offered nothing in return to me and just ended up taking up a lot of energy for me to reorganize material, like stuff that was in my life. So, you know, we cleaned through, we had a storage unit, we cleaned through that, we sold a house and moved into a smaller house. Um, just even technology, um, and I still get caught up in this, but having technology work for me, my phone, not controlling my life. And I really try to limit when I use my phone. Like if I'm with my children, I want to spend that quality time with my children, not sitting there on a screen. And I've, I've integrated this, my talks, but the average American, um, and this comes out of, uh, Jared Diamond his research is gun germs and steel. And yeah. And the average American North American spends six hours a day in screen time and actually checks their phone every four minutes. And you got to think is that, is that technology controlling me or is that good use of my time? So it takes a lot of discipline and a bit of a plan, but I've really tried to really focus how my time is spent. And when you're immersed in a natural setting with very limited distractions, you get a huge appreciation for how long a minute is and what you can get done in a minute. And um, so I've really tried to integrate that into my life. Like I actually think it's a, a core of my essence now. Like that is something that'll stick with me until the, the last day of my life. It's just how, how important time is and how you spend it. And just, I don't find things frazzled me very much. <laughs> it's easier said than done, but when you're you're in a situation where you're faced with wild animals, really extreme uh, weather, um, you're starving. It's really hard to get frazzled by things like traffic jams or lineups or, you know, small things like not being able to get a cappuccino or <laughs> you, you approach things in life a lot differently. How are you bringing that understanding into your family or I mean, obviously your kids, when they found out, oh, mom's starving herself to death <laughs> <laughs> and her, she has sore teeth. You know, what was that? What is that process? What was that process like? And also, what is the balance of modeling or teaching for your children now? Yeah. And it's a, you know, these are things my, my own children are going to have to experience themselves. I can model a lot of these and they've seen the TV show and they know I've done it. But the, the only thing I can do is give them the opportunities to try to test their own limits as well. And that's one thing with children nowadays, nature deficiency disorder. Um, a lot of children are really cocooned. And I find this myself too, even when I drive my children to school and back after school, back to home, is that I have to allow my children to figure a lot of this out on their own within limits, within safe limits. Like I'm not going to put my children out in the woods and say, okay, go fend for yourself. But I have to, I can model a lot of this, but I also have given my children opportunities to push their boundaries a little bit, whether it's in sports or whether it's spending time when we go out camping and um, allowing them to go down to the lake by themselves and have the proper training to know how to deal with situations if they are faced with a situation that may not be the best. Um, but to allow them, I really feel that builds self-esteem and is really the true um, means of self-growth is being faced with those situations where you can test your boundaries and troubleshoot on the fly. So um, we kind of work a little bit side by side in different companies, but I, something I've noticed is that you're quite the operator. You are very productive at work and you, um, people speak very highly of you. And I'm wondering, you know, as a, as somebody who operates at a really high vibration, what, what rituals do you have now in your life that, um, if any, or do you just, you know, do you explode out of bed or is that like, what do you, what have you brought into your daily practice? I guess if you have one. Yeah. Um, Nutrition. yeah. And I think I've, I think I've been at the brink of burnout throughout different parts of my career and I've kind, kind of retreated a bit and tried to, um, have downtime for myself to, um, 
just allow myself to revisit how I approach different situations. But one thing I've done on a daily basis is allow myself a bit more space. So I wake up early in the morning. I usually wake up um, before 6 a.m. and I recharge for the day. Like I, I have a bit of downtime, but I have time to myself where I can just sit in quietness and just sort of focus on where I want to go for the day and not, you know, jump out of bed and all of a sudden be busy with chaos, but actually have that time to contemplate and do a bit of visioning on where I want to go. And I also do it at the end of the day too, where, and I usually do it, try to multitask, um, but not where it's too busy, but I'll walk the dog in nature and just sort of revisit how I could have approached things differently or how I might take a different tactic and, um, you know, keep progressively moving forward in a positive manner with relationships and different projects and uh, looking at end goal planning as well. Do you have any physical kind of routines? Yeah, I think that's a really big one too is, um, is stay, yeah, one thing I do um, after I walk the dog is my husband and I have a gym in our house and we usually work out together every night. And it also allows us to talk and sort of summarize the day together. So it's a nice way to um, spend time together. Um, one thing I did do this this recently in the last couple of months is I pulled a ligament in my knee, and which was a huge shock for me, like the way I did it. But because um, it wasn't living out in the woods or it was just crazy how it happened. It happened in the city, but uh, in a hotel. Um, but it made me realize that once again, that no one is immune to having their health compromised. And when you are of good health and you're, you know, like a well-oiled machine, you really need to appreciate that and, and just really have a sense of gratitude for things going well. And we're so lucky in this part of the world. We have so many things at our disposal, huge opportunities. I, I look at so many things as opportunities now. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And so true. It's so fragile. Like there yeah. is a fragility. And I think that's that fragility is very easy to lose sight of in our daily life because of the amount of distractions we have. What have you opened space for? So getting rid of all of this stuff. Yeah. Have you, you must, it must be just simplify. Anytime you simplify, anytime I simplify, I find there's, all of a sudden, all this other space. And it's, do you find it a challenge to not fill it with other things? Completely. I find that it's a daily practice to maintain an open sense of space and to really revisit what's important for myself and my family and to continually keep some space open to allow uh, those good opportunities to come in and that downtime where we can fill it with with other opportunities that may come our way. But if, if it's continually full and our days are overscheduled or we're just consumed by stuff in our life, it's very hard to um, open change and new opportunities into your life. Do you identify with your past? I mean, obviously this was a massive event in your life. How do you think you'll identify with this? And is it part, I mean, it's obviously part of you, but is it part of your identity? ID. I mean, everywhere we see, I see your name now. It's like Megan, biologist, forester, <laughs> survivor, you know, like <laughs> what, you know, what's next for you? How do you think like you'll evolve or like, what do you, what do you hope for yourself? I guess. Um, yeah, it's hard to get away from being on a major network and a very popular TV show. Um, but for myself, I really don't latch on to that. For other people who have seen the show, that may be how their introduction me inter, introduction to me is prefaced. But for me, um, it's not about fame and and the TV world. For me, it was always about something different. And it was always about values and the experience and the journey and really staying true to the rules that govern that for me. So for me, not a lot has changed. Um, I do get invitations for speaking opportunities and other opportunities. And yeah, definitely I'm trying to leverage that in a good way, not necessarily for me as an individual, but just for messaging and to, to show that um, we can live sustainably, sustainably in sync with the natural world. And, and just to revisit uh, as human beings, the human experience and, and how simplicity can be part of our life and, 
and just to really focus in on, on time and relationships and uh, the, the true things that, that are really at the core of any other human on earth. It's just so, it's so inspiring and I'm really looking forward to, uh, I have two girls and I, you know, having, having proof of concept, I think, you know, people can do this and people can stretch themselves further. And I think when you start doing that, you start simplifying more and getting closer to yourself. And I think, you know, being comfortable in your own skin it's probably the number one thing everybody should be working on. Yeah. You know, if I was benevolent dictator, everybody work on yourself. But getting comfortable in your own skin, I think, is the reward that you may have come out with, which yeah, is more and, valuable than anything. And I think that's part of the human experience. It's just really defining what are the rules that you want to, to be to be governing your life. And Callie, who was also on season three, who was really a fan favorite, she approached that journey in a positive, uh, really grateful uh, point of view with, um, you know, just with a view of abundance around her. We've really uh, bonded after that experience because we both tapped out in the top five. We were the two that tapped out. And we kind of joked, you know, we should almost write a book about the art of quitting because for us, it wasn't so much about the money, but it was... You know, we had to leave with leaving the show and and tapping out, but it didn't matter to us. We didn't care what anyone else thought. It wasn't about not getting the money and and you wouldn't ending. think anything about anybody at that point. No, that's true. <laughs> but like for us, it was about what did we want to get out of this experience? And yeah, it was on a major network. And I think in the end, it's well over it's tens of millions of people that watch the seasons. Wow. Like at the time, it's two million, but then it goes through all the countries and. You get all the hundreds of invites from Africa and Australia through social media, and you that's how you know it's showing in a different country. But, you know, for us, it was more about the journey and our rules governing in that. And when we knew we had accomplished what we wanted, and I had a broken tooth at the end, but I felt fulfilled that I had accomplished what I wanted to on that journey. So I was at peace when I ended up tapping out. It's an um, incredible experience. It is. And I think... That in itself is somewhat symbolic too, is that, you know, what are the rules that are going to govern your life? And, you know, you might maybe not get to the end goal that you thought you're originally going to, but that's okay. You can re-divert and take that experience of that journey and refocus it, whatever other route you're going on in life. So tens of, you know, say 10 million people have seen this. Have you been getting a lot of uh, any emails or? Oh my gosh. Yeah. You get Tell me about so all many. the nuts. <laughs> so you know what? Like um, when I was still on the show before I tapped out, I started actually thinking about it and uh, started really realizing what I got myself into because we had only seen season one and a couple of shows of season two. It was a really new show when we actually got launched. And I started to realize like, wow, like people are going to know my children's names. And I'm a fairly private person and the interesting thing about the show that we learned from the psychologists who did the assessments on us is that all of us are introverts some of us may seem like ambioverts and i don't mind isn't that a prerequisite if you're a forester it, yeah you i think so and a survivalist living out in the woods but yeah. all of us are introverts but yet you're doing such an intimate thing and exposing yourself to the world so it's a bit of a it's a bit mind-boggling but one thing that you know, I started to really contemplate when I was out there is that they're going to show my whole family, my kids and like, and, uh, I got thousands, like thousands of texts and emails once people found out I was on the show. And then still to this day, I get emails from people all over the world. And give me a cross section of that inspirational. Oh, thank you. Or <laughs> inspirational. Is it, uh, many of them, the many of them are inspirational, but it, it's, I'd say it's, truly representative of humans because you'll get some crazy emails. You'll get a lot of positive, inspirational ones. People really appreciated that on season three, the three women did amazing. Yes. We did amazing. Like yes. came, three of the women that were on the show came in the top five. And um, of so course. people, people like, are really, yeah, they were really yeah. shocked by that, but they shouldn't be shocked by that. It's just, you know, it shouldn't matter if you're male or female. Well, I'm a big guy. And I know for, I am very realistic about the fact that, you know, even with top knowledge, 
uh, going into a challenge like that, I am going to suffer immensely because yeah. just my metabolism is totally. super smoking. Like yeah. it, 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 you know, I have to eat a lot. Like, and I do eat a lot, yeah. um, just to regulate my weight and, and, uh, yeah, there's no way. I would like starve to death immediately. My muscles would eat me and that's yeah, it. Yeah. You know, my husband says the same too. He's like, he gets hungry every four hours and he's like, there's no way I would do that. <laughs> yeah. I know it's interesting, but it, it it's just, it's also very interesting how the, you know, all of the contestants, but the three women too approached it from different ways too. Talk about like, are people giving you advice now post? Giving me advice on yeah. how I, oh yeah. People are like, you should have done that or you would have won it if it wasn't for the tooth. And yeah, thanks. <laughs> you know, that's the other, that's the other complexity to this really intimate journey. That's a huge part of my life as an individual <laughs> is that overriding the whole thing is that it was a TV show, that it was a TV show with huge ratings and a lot of people involved in the editing and transcribing and the sponsorship and the advertising and History Channel is a very big network and, you know, it was their biggest, uh, I think it was their second or first biggest um, non-fictional show and it still is. It's very popular. Have you ever read the Hunger Games series? Oh, yeah. 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 I can relate to that. <laughs> Did you ever wish there was like a sponsorship parachute? Yeah, totally. <laughs> or like at least if you could see the name up in the sky so you knew <laughs> who was tapping out. But, you know, all of us are quite close. Um and that's the one thing uh, about the contestants that were picked. All of us were deserving of winning and we're all great people. Like, I think all of us truly were just really great people. Like, I can't imagine any of the fellow contestants that I wouldn't have wanted to win. They're just uh, just amazing people. And all the ones I've met from past seasons are also just great people. Did you spend a lot of time with the other contestants as the, uh, we at did. the end? Or I guess after you Not got at healed. The end, no, but uh, when we were in New York through the bush camp before they picked uh, their 10, you kind of got to know people. But then after New York, you weren't supposed to contact any of the other potential contestants. And then um, right before we launched in Patagonia, we did have five days together. Um, but not we weren't allowed to strategize. or, But we did sort of get to know each other a little bit better. And um yeah, just great people. And since then, we all stay in contact. And I consider some of the contestants some of my best colleagues and friends. And Which is fascinating because you shared an experience, but not each other. Yeah, which is the beauty of the show as well, because it was, a, it was just a challenge with yourself. And yes, you were competing for this external monetary amount, but it's kind of the beauty of it is that you're not undermining another human being. You're, you're truly just in a challenge with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, I am on Instagram and uh, I'm on Facebook as well. And professionally I'm on LinkedIn. Um, but that's probably the, yeah, that's the best way. And I, I do offer courses and, and run the circuit with talks. So. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. I'll include those in the show notes sure. as well. Just okay. links. And you should definitely see Megan's work um, or just follow her. And I just really appreciate the time. This is really the essence, I think, of the Ranger Cabin is this idea of taking time to find a safe space for yourself and getting rid of the things you don't need so you can make clear decisions. And then more importantly than that, walking out the door and seeing what you can find out there and understanding the land. And I think that to me is a really fascinating, um, something, something worth trying every day to understand your landscape. I think so many of us forget about our own backyard and our own neighborhoods and more and more that challenge of like connecting with people and even my neighbors, um, finding out who they are, what's their backstory and just totally. on a basic level. And as we lose that, as we lose those daily connections, we're seeing the repercussions of that on social media and yeah. the polarization of our political systems and all of the decisions being made. It seems very black and white. Everything is very binary. And I, yeah. you know, this idea of understanding your landscape could come 
uh, we could all find a common ground. I agree. A little faster. Yeah. Yeah, I do agree. The human experience is what binds us all. And there are a lot of uh, overlaps. Even if we might seem like we come from different backgrounds, there's a lot of commonality if we just take that time to explore it. Is there anything else you want to add? No, thanks for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Megan. Thanks. Well, that was incredible. Uh, What a great start to the series. I just want to thank you so much for joining us today and um, for listening. I really appreciate it. I'm looking so forward to any questions, any comments, any uh, conversations that get started after the podcast. You can join us on social media. Um, I'm sure Megan will be on there as well. She can answer some questions. All the links and points of note that we discussed in the conversation are listed down below in the show notes. Uh, You can find those either down below or on the rangercabin.com, depending on how you're listening, uh, on marked on each episode on the website here moving forward. A few fact checks that I looked into, according to the World Health Organization, that too, the UN body, uh, 2 billion, not 1 billion people, as I said in the conversation, 2 billion people do not have access to water without trace feces in it that's every day two billion people oh man it's staggering uh the margay cat that megan mentioned that kind of uh finished her off potentially but really caused her to rejig her traps etc it's on the near threatened conservation list not the endangered list a small detail but i just wanted to um get it right and for those of you interested in that um interested in your thoughts really really interesting turn of events for her i think and it cost her a lot um a lot in the physical department definitely not in the integrity department so a wild lesson there i think um is found and and an important one so thanks for subscribing here rating the show leaving your comments constructively joining in the conversations at therangercabin.com. What did you enjoy about this episode? What questions did you wish I asked? What did you like? What didn't you like? All of your input is welcome. Until next time, I'm Zach. Keep your fire hot. Talk to you soon.